Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is another case of a murdered family. It's a pretty intense case involving robbers, a kidnapping, and drugs with an extensive investigation that took years to finally solve. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody thinks about this case after hearing the details. With that being said, let's just get started with the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of the Karagia family. The Karagia family was a blended family with lots of different members, so I'll try my best to be clear and concise as possible when talking about the family, as well as the ones that were victims in this case. 37-year-old Christelle Lynn Karagia was born on October 6th, 1979. Growing up, she was described as eager to explore, unafraid to try anything new, and she just had this larger-than-life personality. She was energetic and vivacious. Christelle had her first child, Ashland, at the age of 16 with her soon-to-be first husband, John Higgins. Then she went on to have her second child, a son named John. But ultimately, John and Christelle didn't end up working out. Even though Christelle had her first child at such a young age, that didn't stop her from becoming the best version of herself possible. She worked hard to get her GED, and she started working as a dental assistant. After several years as working as a dental assistant, she decided to go the entrepreneurial route. She went on to open Christelle's Java Hut. By the age of 26, Christelle married John Karagia, who went by Johnny, and now all of a sudden, she was the stepmother of five additional children, who I will talk about in just a minute. Then, after meeting her second husband, Johnny, they expanded and added to her business. They added Juanito's Taquerita to the building and gave the town a taste of some good, authentic Mexican-style food in an area that was not known for its Mexican food. Christelle was known for being an amazing mother to the seven children she suddenly became a parent to. She loved working at Juanito's taco shop, and she loved going on vacation to sunny places. 43-year-old John Derek Caragia, who went by Johnny, was born on April 29th, 1973 in Bremerton, Washington. He had previously had a child named Hunter with another woman named Carly Shep. Now, it's a little bit unclear whether Hunter is John's biological son because his obituary does list someone else as Hunter's birth father, but all other reports list John as his father, so that isn't totally clear. But either way, John and Carly did ultimately split up, and by the time John met Christelle, he had a total of five children from previous relationships. Jeremy, Jacob, Joseph, Brianna, and of course, Hunter. Either way, those around Johnny said that his children were his absolute pride and joy. He had a kind spirit, a passion for helping others, and he just had this zest for life. The restaurant that he owned with his wife had always been a dream of his, and bringing it to fruition was such a big accomplishment for him. It's actually very highly rated on Google and other review sites. Johnny absolutely found joy in preparing authentic food for people to enjoy. Those who knew John said that he met no stranger, and his welcoming smile made all who came into the restaurant feel like family, and not just any other customer. In total, Christelle and John had a blended family of seven, five boys and two girls. Two of the boys were Hunter Shap and John Higgins. Hunter Shap was born on March 26, 2000. He was known for being full of energy and loving to make people laugh. He had been a junior at North Kitsap High School at the time of his death. Hunter absolutely loved sports. He played t-ball when he was little and then went on to play baseball and football in high school. He was known for having tons of friends who loved him. At the same time, he also worked at Juanito's Taco Shop with the family to make some extra money. John Felipe Higgins was born on July 9th, 2000. He was known to be a gentle giant with a big heart. He loved the water and was an avid swimmer. He loved classic cars and even owned a 1963 Chevy Impala and a 1983 Buick Regal. He too worked at Juanito's Taco Shop after school and on the weekends where he saved up all of his money so that he could afford those classic cars. He too was a junior and he attended Clahoya Secondary School in Bremerton. Now, the evening of January 27th, 2017 started as a normal Friday in Kitsap County, Washington. The family had some guests over and they spent their evening watching TV, snacking, and hanging out. 
By all accounts, everybody was acting normally and was in a good mood until Johnny had received a phone call. After getting that phone call, Johnny actually left the home saying that he had to go meet somebody, but that he would be back shortly. Surveillance videos would later confirm that he headed to Camp Union Grocery Store at around 9 p.m. that evening. He's seen pulling into the parking lot next to an unidentified car. He spent some time in the parking lot and it appeared that he talked to the person in that car. And then a cashier in the store confirmed that he went inside the store to buy himself a pack of cigarettes. According to the cashier, he seemed normal. He was polite, cheerful, talkative, and had good energy. Nothing about their interaction seemed off. Then, Johnny is seen leaving the parking lot on surveillance video. After that, however, by 11.30 p.m., 911 receives a call from Hunter Shep to report that he has been shot and that his family is all dead. The call lasted for about 38 seconds before the line is cut off, either from him hanging up or somebody taking the phone from him. In the call, it clearly sounds like Hunter is just using whatever energy he has to make this call. There is some swearing in it, but you can't really judge someone in their last moments like that because he was literally just shot. So just a warning, there is vulgar language. You might not like how he was acting in the 911 call, but again, he was just shot. So I'm sure most people wouldn't be on their most polite behavior after they've been shot and they just want help. Kids have no one reporting. Oh, my whole family shot me too. What's the Please address? Now. What's the address? One three four one seven two nine zero Drive West. One three four one seven. One three four one seven two nine zero Drive West. Come now. What, what's the right now, You said tonight. You said tonight. Oh, Drive West. One three four one seven two nine zero Drive West. Okay. I'm in Washington. Okay. I, listen. I'm, dying. Who, I'm shot right now. My family's who, dead. Who did it? Someone came in. There's someone here with the gun. I don't know if you need, you need to come now. How how many people? I don't know, bro. Just fucking come, yo. Where are My you shot? Is fucking dead. Come, man. Where are you shot? Yeah. Um, I'm fucking shot, bro. I don't know where I'm. Either way, when authorities arrived, they showed up to a house that was absolutely engulfed in flames. It had been set on fire. Once firefighters arrived and were able to get the fire under control, investigators entered the home, and what they walked into was just a brutal scene. They found three bodies, each had been shot to death. Christelle had been found with one shot to her head, and John was also shot in the head. Then they found that Hunter had been shot three times, and he was found with a pillow under his head. But Johnny, Christelle's husband, both him and his car were nowhere to be found. So at this point, police didn't know what to make of the scene. Police asked the public to be on the lookout for 43-year-old John Derek Caragia, as well as his 2005 Brown Ford F-150 truck. At that point, he was just considered to be a missing person, but obviously with his entire family being murdered and him conveniently leaving right beforehand, that looked very suspicious on his part. Even though Hunter said that he didn't know who shot them, this whole thing just didn't look really good for John at first. But then, after searching for two days, Mason County deputies found Johnny. They found that his truck had been burnt out at a tree farm in Mason County about an hour away from Kitsap County. And inside of the truck, they found the body of Johnny he too had been shot to death. Now, like I said, the family had some guests over that evening, so police went ahead and spoke with them about what happened that night. As I mentioned before, that evening, Johnny had left the home to go to the grocery store with the rest of the family still at home. According to the guests, a short time after Johnny left, they saw some headlights coming back up in their driveway and they all assumed that it was Johnny returning home. But Johnny never came inside. So one of the guests actually went outside in the attached garage to check for him, but he wasn't there. Instead, the guest heard three men talking in raised voices outside of the home. The guest tried listening for what these men were saying, but he couldn't make anything out. But the guest said that he accidentally made a noise, and when he did, the voices stopped. So after that, the guests left. After the guests left, Christelle went out into the garage to check for herself. 
And it was at that point that police believe that Christelle was ambushed by these men who shot her in the head. At that time, John had been in his room, but he heard a commotion going on. So he came out to see what was going on. And as Johnny was walking out of the room, that is when John was also shot in the head. Then as that was happening, Hunter had actually initially been out of the home. But as these men were shooting John, Hunter had just returned home and was walking in with a pizza. At that point, it is believed that he was ambushed by one of the men who fired a shot and missed. But then they fired two more shots, which did hit Hunter. And then the men appeared to have thought that he was dead at first. But after hearing that 911 call, police believe that his phone was either taken or he dropped the phone. Then a pillow was placed in the back of his head before a third and final shot was fired, killing Hunter. At the scene, police found shell casings, which mostly belonged to a 9mm handgun on the back deck and the driveway of the home. This was a big thing that the reporters were talking about in the initial days and months of this investigation, that it was reported that mostly 9mm shells were found. So a lot of people speculated that this was more than one shooter. And as we confirmed with the three men and the witness statements, there was more than one shooter. But we don't necessarily know the caliber of the other guns that were fired. Then they found that fire starting logs had been placed on the beds located within opposite sides of the home. These logs were soaked with accelerant and then set on fire. It was also thought that the bodies were also doused with accelerant. Then investigators found that rocks had been thrown into the home through the windows with the purpose of helping to spread the fire. They said that from what they could tell, there was no sign of forced entry, although it was not totally possible to tell for sure because of the damage that the fire had caused. Then when it came to the scene of where Johnny was found, there wasn't really any answers there either. They found that in order to get into this big tree farm, you had to get past a big heavy metal fence that was protected by a big heavy metal gate. They found that this gate had been knocked down and the force required to knock down such a heavy gate is actually quite a lot. It appeared that either Johnny or somebody driving Johnny's car had rammed the truck into the gate in order to knock it down. Then the truck was parked and burned where it would later be found. All police found at the scene was a single latex glove on the ground, but other than that, they were pretty much at a loss for answers. As police started their investigation, obviously the first step was to figure out why. What could have been going on behind the scenes to cause someone to want to murder a family like this? They genuinely seemed like the most normal family with no obvious issues. They investigated anybody that the family knew to see if there were any issues with the other children who didn't live in the home with them. Was there possibly any issues with either of their exes? Was there issues with anybody in the extended family? They couldn't find anything that pointed to that. Then they wondered if somebody in the relationship was unfaithful. Was there some sort of love triangle happening that made someone want to take them out like that? They found no evidence of that either. But as investigators searched through the Karagia home, they found more evidence that could point them towards what happened. Investigators actually found that the family had a legal medical marijuana growing operation in their garage. They had 33 medical marijuana plants growing there. Then they found almost $60,000 worth of cash in the home as well. Of that, they found $50,000 was in a safe under the bed in the master bedroom. And then they found another $7,000 in a bank deposit bag in a dresser in the home. So now police started to wonder if their legal operation was impeding someone else's illegal operation and that is what led them to being murdered. So again, they had marijuana plants growing, they had this whole selling operation, but it was completely legal and they were selling it to medical marijuana places that sold it then. But still, even with that, police seemed to be no closer to getting the answers that they were looking for. They really just needed to make sense of all of this. Months passed and police didn't give the public any updates. 
it really just seemed like they were at a standstill. But then about one year after the murders, police went to the public to release information regarding a person of interest in the case. In January of 2018, police announced that they believed that these murders weren't just a random attack or some sort of robbery gone wrong. The fact that the money was found still in the home shows them that the shooters weren't there to necessarily rob them. They knew that there were multiple shooters and they said that this was a very meticulously planned out murder. Then they released a still taken from surveillance footage at a Target in Silverdale. This still showed a man entering the store at 7.44 p.m. on Sunday, January 15th, 2017, 12 days before the murders. Then they said that as this man was walking in, they saw a silver four-door sedan driving past the front of the store. He was also seen wearing clothing that they knew was associated with the Bandidos Motorcycle Club. Bandidos is Washington state's largest motorcycle gang with an estimated 250 members in the state and about 2,500 members throughout the country. Police announced that they knew that the members of the Bandidos Motorcycle Club were directly involved with the Caragia family murders. Turns out, police later identified this man as being Danny J. Kelly Jr., and he was known as being an associate of Johnny's in the past. But again, other than that, the police really didn't say much. Two years passed in the investigation, and at this point, the FBI have gotten involved and reportedly, they were trying out new technological advances to investigate. Then, in June of 2018, tragedy struck this family once again. Another one of John's sons, then 20-year-old Joseph, was actually killed in a car accident. Turns out that Joseph was in the car with his then girlfriend who was going 120 miles per hour when she hit another car. She survived the crash as it seems always happens in these cases where the driver is being irresponsible, they survive but no one else does. So unfortunately in this case, Joseph did not survive the crash. Eventually, she was tried and sentenced to nine and a half years behind bars for vehicular manslaughter. Then, by January of 2020, three years after the murders, police came to the public once again to remind everybody that they believed that the Bandidos Motorcycle Club were involved in the murders. They asked that other members of the biker club come forward with any information that they knew. Then finally, using this special FBI task force and the new technology that they had been working with, on June 6, 2022, five years after the murders, police had finally arrested three suspects in the killings. They arrested 43-year-old Danny Kelly Jr., 50-year-old Robert J. Watson III, and Robert's brother, 49-year-old Johnny Watson. These men were all involved with the Bandidos Motorcycle Club. They were then charged with 16 different crimes, including aggravated first-degree murder. Then they were all given a $20 million bail, and they have all pleaded not guilty for their involvement in these murders. Today for us has been celebratory in a sense. Victims' family members watched as the judge set the stage for how to proceed with the trial of the three men charged in the deaths of John and Cristal Cariega, Jonathan Higgins, and Hunter Scop. Johnny and Robert Watson and Danny Kelly each faced 16 criminal charges, ranging from murder to kidnapping. These are people that we do not want in our community. These are people that you do not want your children to come across later. We need to start holding people accountable. So now let's discuss what information led investigators to connecting the quadruple murders to these three men. Those around Johnny Caragia described him as a family man who stood up for himself and was very protective over his family. However, despite owning and operating a successful Mexican food restaurant and running a legitimate medical marijuana grow operation, Johnny was involved with other things on the side. Turns out that Johnny was going to California every month to bring a kilo of cocaine back home to sell in Kitsap. Investigators found out that Johnny had a close friend who worked with him to sell the cocaine, and this friend began working with Robert Watson, who was the leader of the local chapter of the Bandidos Motorcycle Club. But eventually, Johnny's close friend stopped selling, so therefore, he stopped acting as the middleman between Johnny and Robert. 
So Johnny and Robert began having direct communication for this cocaine selling operation. So after they started communication directly, that next time that Johnny went out to California to collect the kilo, Robert followed him there. He basically tailed him there. That caused some trouble between the men and tensions only rose from there. As that was happening, Robert took Danny Kelly in under his wing as a member of the Banditos Biker Club. At that point, those around Danny said that Robert really had him under his thumb. Danny would do anything that Robert asked of him. Now, Danny actually also has a connection with Johnny as well. The two had actually been very close at one point, with Danny even being Johnny's best man at the wedding to his first wife. But after that, the friends had a falling out after Johnny blamed Danny for stealing his money. Now, remember, police announced to the public that they found surveillance video of Danny entering that target about 12 days before the murders, but they didn't initially tell us what significance that had. It turned out that Danny had actually purchased a burner phone that day that he used to exclusively talk to Johnny Caragia in the 10 days leading to the murders. So, now going back to the night of the murders. As I stated before, on the night of January 27th, 2017, the family had some friends over that evening before Johnny answered the phone and left to go meet up with someone. Later, surveillance cameras would see his car arriving to the Camp Union grocery store, pulling up next to another unidentified sedan. Reports now say that the cars were seen parked to one another for several minutes before Johnny got his cigarettes and left. The other car left the parking lot and drove to a neighboring church parking lot and turned the headlights off. Then we know what happened after that. The family thought that Johnny had come home when in reality, it was three men who ambushed them and killed each member of the family. Like I said, when police arrived to the home, they found that rocks had been thrown through the windows to help spread the fire. Turns out police tested these rocks for DNA and their testing showed that Johnny Watson's DNA couldn't be ruled out. Then we find out that there was a witness on the night of the murders. This witness was a neighbor who heard the gunshots go off in the house. Then this person saw Johnny Caragia's truck speeding away with another silver car following close behind, so close that it was almost bumper to bumper. So again, when Danny was seen entering that target, they saw that same type of car driving past the door as he was walking in. So it looked like this silver sedan dropped Danny off at the target and then it was also spotted at the scene of the murders. This witness, the neighbor, identified Danny Kelly as the one who was driving Johnny's truck but they didn't know who was driving the other car. The witness was confident though that it was Danny that they saw driving the truck because Danny had actually lived in that house that Johnny and his family were now living in previously. So this neighbor recognized him for sure. After the murders at around 4 a.m. that next morning, so now going into January 28th, Robert apparently showed up at the home of another Banditos member. So this was around four hours after he allegedly was involved in killing four people. When he showed up to that house, he wasn't wearing pants, so he asked the friend if he could borrow some. Then he washed his hands at the friend's house, saying that he had just been in a fight with a homeless black man. After that, he left the house in a car, which the friend thought was weird because they thought that Robert had shown up on foot. Later that day, on the 28th, Robert called 911 to report that his truck had been broken into several days earlier. He said that he found his windows smashed out and reported that his Glock handgun and a second loaded magazine had been stolen out of his car. By the time police arrived to take a statement though, he said that he had already cleaned up the glass from the broken window. Then, as I stated, a few days after the murders, police found Johnny's burnt out truck. Well, a few days after finding that truck, they found Johnny Watson's car, a 2006 Mercedes, dumped in the Pulliup River about two hours away from where Johnny's car had been found. They found that the Mercedes had been stripped of the carpets, seats, headlights, and seat belts. All those items were removed from the car. However, things that were typically stolen from cars, such as the tires, radio, airbags, etc., 
all of those things remained in that car. The car was also found to have missing plates and it was never reported as stolen. So clearly it seemed to the police that Johnny probably stripped his own car and dumped it in that river, possibly with the purpose of hiding evidence because it seemed that nobody else stole the car because it wasn't reported and the things that were normally stolen were not missing. So what does that say? you can pretty much make that out for yourself. Then, police reported that they were able to use cell phone records, including the burner phone that Danny used, in order to track down the three suspects and Johnny Caragia to where they were before, during, and after the murders. They didn't elaborate too much on this, but this obviously led them somewhere significant. Otherwise, I don't think that this information would have been included in what they released. Then they found that even though Danny had been communicating exclusively with Johnny in the days before the murders using that burner phone, he immediately stopped communicating with him right after the murders. So clearly, he knew something. He knew enough to know that he was not there to be communicating with anymore. His body hadn't been found for days and it was all over the media that he was just considered a missing person in the days after the family was murdered. So it's not like he could have known that he was killed along with the rest of the family unless he had some other inside knowledge. Then it turned out that in September of 2017, Robert Watson completely just stopped going to work, so he was fired. So he wasn't working, so he shouldn't have had much of an income. But detectives found that $303,000 was deposited into his account that same year, and there are numerous other deposits made where the source couldn't be identified. So again, somehow he was still making money, even though he wasn't working legally. So this could be connected to the whole cocaine selling business. Now, what police are still working on to identify is exactly what happened to Johnny and his car after the grocery store stop. Did he make it home or was he intercepted shortly after leaving? We don't know for sure, but police believe that he was taken in at least one of the cars at some points before the murders, kidnapped, and then killed somewhere else. They also don't know how long they had been harboring the truck before it was dumped and burned, so that's something they also are working to find out. Either way, police said that they just know that there's a third crime scene and now it's just about finding where it is. There have also been reports that the family was hiding $200,000 under the house, but the police didn't find it. So it was either stolen or that was just false rumors. We don't know for sure. So again, we said earlier that it probably wasn't a robbery because this other money was still left there but they could have had this $200,000 that was stolen. This also could just be speculation. We're not sure, it hasn't been confirmed, but if it was stolen, that adds to even more of this motive. Police at this point have said that the motives for this crime are very complicated. We don't know exactly what caused these tensions, but they have said that they think it's a combination of a few things. The first could be as simple as having conflicting personalities and Johnny didn't work well with the others, so that is what caused this falling out and bad blood. The other motives involve drugs and money. But again, we don't know if that $200,000 was stolen or if it wasn't there to begin with. We don't know exactly what sparked the murders to happen at the exact time that they did. We also don't have all of the evidence that led them to these three suspects because we truly don't know what physical evidence they have that connects each man to this crime. Because as of right now, it doesn't really seem like they have enough to get a conviction, but this is still a very ongoing case. Good afternoon. Well, these arrests are five years in the making, so there's a lot to go through. But according to the court documents, there is evidence that shows that Robert Watson had known that John Cariega had been transporting kilos of cocaine from Southern California to Washington. And evidence is also showing that Cariega had a relationship with both Watson and, um, and another individual that was arrested today that included drug trafficking. Court documents paint a dubious history between John Cariega and the men charged with executing him and his family. The documents state Watson began communicating with John Cariega after Cariega's friends said he would no longer be selling Cariega's cocaine to Watson. The documents also say Danny Kelly, who was a new member of the Banditos, was once friends with and sold marijuana for Cariega. 
but had a falling out over money around 10 years ago. I would say the motive for the crime is complicated. It's a, I, it's involving drugs, money. Um, there's definitely some personality conflicts, but ultimately that's going to be an answer that only the suspects are going to know. It's going to, it's going to revolve around drugs and money. It's going to revolve around that. Is that the only aspects of the motive? Probably not. But I would say those two are probably the primary. We're dealing with people who are associated with um, the Banditos Motor Motorcycle Club. Do I think that the club uh, is going to actively threaten or intimidate? Probably not. I think we've got some good rapport with some of the higher members of the club. So I, I trust that, that that's not going to happen. But, you know, there's still concern. Um, we know that there's another crime scene somewhere. We know that there's more people that are either involved or have information. Um, and so the crime happened on a Friday night and we did not find the truck until Sunday afternoon. But we found it on that rural tree farm on Sunday afternoon. However, on Saturday afternoon, a caretaker of that tree farm had been on the property and that truck wasn't there. So we do know that Johnny and the truck were held somewhere in either the Seabeck area or North Mason area um, before being transported to the Seabeck or to that tree farm area. As we speak, these three men are going through their preliminary hearings. We still don't have a trial date and we still don't know all of the evidence that they have in this case. I have a feeling that this trial will expose this new technology that police were using. Hopefully, there is even more physical evidence that they just aren't releasing right now. But that is all of the information that we have for this case. In my opinion, I think this could be a situation of these three men being hired to execute Johnny and that his family was just unfortunate collateral in this. I think that this was either because of money, because as we know, Robert was somehow getting these large sums of money in his bank accounts that couldn't be traced, so something happened after the murders that benefited him financially. So was it because he killed them to make more money? Did someone else hire them to kill them so that they could make more money and that they paid Robert to do this? We don't really know. I am really looking forward to hearing what comes out about this case in the trials, if there is a trial. I am curious to see if all the men will be tried together or separately. And I'm also looking forward to seeing if there is a more concrete motive here or if it seemed to be more of like a random thing. I know police said that it was a very meticulously planned out attack. They spent weeks to months planning it out. So there must have been something that caused all of this, but we don't exactly know what it was. I think the most shocking turn of events with this case was the fact that Johnny was involved in coke dealing. This truly is stuff straight out of a TV show, but this stuff really does happen in real life. It's crazy that this totally normal family man who operates a successful business can also be involved in such criminal activity. It really makes me wonder who, if anyone, knew about his involvement in the coke dealing. Did Chris Dale know? If not, how did he explain those trips to California every month? I have no idea. But even with this crazy turn of events, we have to remember that no matter what Johnny was involved with, these children and Chris Dale were innocent victims in all of this. They didn't deserve what happened to them no matter what Johnny was involved with, he obviously didn't deserve it either, but especially those kids. They were only 16 at the time and they just had so much life ahead of them. It's just so sad when kids are innocent collateral for actions of someone that they trusted. It's just so heartbreaking and I'm sure the rest of the family is just devastated that all of this happened. I know Hunter's mother has been very outspoken about how upsetting this whole thing is and how tragic it is, but... That is all the information that I have on today's case. As I said, with any new information that comes out, you will all be the first to be updated. But now I want to know what you guys think. Do you guys think that police have the right suspects in custody? What do you think the motive truly was? Do you think that the police have more evidence that connects them to the crime? Or do you think that they'll have a pretty loose case going into trial? 
Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you check out my Facebook page as well as my Twitter and Instagram. All of those will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.